Well, let me tell you something, brothers. Thank you for the support and kind words on the Iron Claw episode, and if you haven't checked that out, you should definitely go do that right after this. But in the makings of it, I got to thinking that since this was such a successful movie, and we also seemingly are getting a Hulk Hogan biopic at some point here in the future, what other possible tales from the CD world of pro wrestling would best make for the next big screen adaptation? Well, while I was working on the next episode, I took a brain break to think it over further, and goddammit if I didn't just come up with a list of them, which you probably already guessed by the title. And if you'll indulge me, I would like to share them with you in ranking format. So here are the next 10 wrestling biopics that should get made. Real quick, just so you guys know where my head is at with this one, what I tried to do with this is come up with 10 different types of movies whose stories center in the wrestling business but are narratively slash thematically different. That way we aren't retreading the same thing. For example, I didn't include the Hart family on this list because while they have a great story as well, full of high drama, controversy, and overwhelming tragedy, I feel like narratively it would feel very close to what we already got in the Iron Claw. I think a movie about them could work, but just not for a little bit of time. Just so you smell what I'm cooking here. And to kick off our list at number 10, well... Who better than Canyon? Nobody! To a great number of wrestling fans, the name Chris Canyon conjures up the tale of a criminally underappreciated pioneer of what would become what we know of today as the indie wrestling style, where work rate, athleticism, and trailblazing technique take center stage as opposed to the slower punch, kick, rest hold days of the Jurassic period of wrestling. And this film's plot should absolutely make this a point to show just how crazy ahead of his time the innovator of offense was, and how many current day's wrestler styles he has inspired with his own. Obviously, the prime focus of this film though should and would have to be the tumultuous inner battle that Chris faced grappling with his sexuality. If you're familiar with the character of Mr. Garrison on South Park, or ironically a subsect of the group that his character goes on to later represent, then you're familiar with the plights of Chris Canyon, a closeted gay man whose deep hatred and classic overcompensating homophobia ended up causing him to go to war with himself. Being an openly gay man in a business such as this one during a time such as the one Chris lived in, well, one would only need to look at the way characters like Adrian Adonis and Goldust were packaged in the 80s and 90s to see that it was obvious in the world of professional wrestling, homosexuality equated to perverted bad guy. This created a perfect storm of a man who hated who he was on the inside, and that hate was reinforced by those in his professional life as well, and tragically led to a predictable conclusion with him taking his own life. I think this could be an emotional and riveting journey into a tortured psyche of someone who was just unfortunately born in the wrong time. For number 9, I went back and forth between two individuals that may have had different paths in their journeys, but thematically they are somewhat similar. I toyed around with giving this spot to Herb Abrams and his creation of the Universal Wrestling Federation and sheer out and out madness that ensued. However, I instead decided to go with Rob Black and the birth slash death slash rebirth of XPW. For those unfamiliar with Rob Zakari, aka Rob Black, he is a seasoned adult film producer who had a love for deathmatch wrestling and decided to fuse the two together in an unholy union known as Extreme Pro Wrestling. And to be honest, I think there could be a lot of fun in a mature themed exploration into the wrestling slash pornography hybrid. It would have to be done the right way and could even be in the same theme as A24's Pearl franchise as feeling sort of grindhousey and gritty, but when you hear descriptions of The Office, it was essentially naked chicks and porn scenes being shot right alongside the booking and planning of the wrestling side of the promotion. Living on your own definitely has its perks. Train, you know, because your mom doesn't tell you to turn down the stereo and junk like that, you know, which is a real drag. Train, train. Anyway, Rob Black is also a manipulative sociopath with a mob boss mentality, and so when you introduce the personal stuff is where it really takes off, such as his rivalry and hatred of Paul Heyman and the exploration of their war with ECW in order to usurp them, the relationship between Rob and his wife, former porn star Lizzie Borden, and the subsequent love triangle with his performer Messiah, and the incidents it caused, such as Rob literally hiring people to try and kill Messiah, and beyond the wrestling, you get into the government battles over the porn business and an exploration into how Rob also shaped that industry as well, being one of the people who popularized extremes, fetishes, and indulgences, and taking pornography to levels that were not the norm at the time, but have since become it. You also get to highlight deathmatch icons such as Supreme, who haven't been introduced to many of today's wrestling fans, but they should, especially given the story of him catching on fire mid-match. Which brings us to the overall message of what this should be. 
when your goal is to keep pushing the envelope, how far is too far and what do you do when you inevitably have to cross the lines? Oh, and this is just for me. After what he had to endure with the nonsense fake Freddy Krueger series stuff earlier this year, damn it, cast poor DJ Qualls as Rob Black, and I bet he crushes it. Well, I guess I'm out because I had sex last night with a girl. <clears throat> Full disclosure for number eight, I had written up this whole thing about how awesome it would be to see a movie where we head over to Japan to tell the story of arguably its most famous wrestler of all time, Ricky Dozan. I made the case for why we should have a movie about him, and thankfully, right before I was set to record, I found out there already is one. An award-winning Japanese slash South Korean film that came out in 2004 and includes one of my favorite Japanese wrestlers of all time, The Great Muda. So go check that out, and instead, let's give this spot to Ken Shamrock. The pro wrestler turned MMA fighter turned pro wrestler again. Ooh, I bet a lot of you didn't know about that first one. He had a short but very impactful career on the big stage of wrestling, but also has an incredibly gripping story to tell with a nice through theme of real family not always being about who your blood is. Ken's real father ran out on his young family when Ken was only five, and I mean young family, as his mother had given birth to Ken's oldest brother when she was 15. Living in a rough area of Atlanta, Ken began fighting early as a means of survival, and he regularly was left to fend for himself. This unfortunately did not change when his mother got remarried to another former military man named Bob Nance, and they moved to Napa, California, where Ken and his three brothers were immediate outsiders and trouble starters, with a 10-year-old Ken getting stabbed by another kid when he attempted to run away from home. Ken would then have his second father give up on him when he kicked him and his brothers out when he was 13, beginning a period of Ken's life where he was sleeping in abandoned cars and robbing other people at knife point as a means of survival. This eventually landed him in trouble with the law and in and out of many group homes in juvie before finally meeting the man who would become the father he needed when he was placed with Bob Shamrock. Bob fully committed himself to helping Ken turn his life around, and he did just that, going on to becoming one of the pioneers and first real stars of early mixed martial arts. Ken's pro fighting career and rivalries with Hoist Gracie, Dan Severn, and Tito Ortiz would make for many great scenes, as would his founding of the first real MMA team, the Lion's Den. And then there is the relationship with his brother Frank Shamrock, another of Bob's adopted sons who Ken had a long sibling rivalry with and whom had an even more impressive MMA career, which adds to that familial theme that can be explored further. There's also the dynamic of real versus quote unquote fake fighting that could be commentated on. But that's, I, I tell people all the time there, James, that I've been hurt far worse in my professional wrestling career than I have been in all my cage fights. And I go, that's it's wrong. Throw in the fact that Ken has a nice comeback story from the depths of addiction and it is a winning recipe for a good movie. And given the announcement of Big Dwayne Daddy Rock Final Johnson's casting for a biopic of another MMA legend, Mark Kerr, this idea has some real legs in my opinion. Number seven is going to take us to the world of hardcore wrestling, and while there are many options for this entry, ultimately there was no one whose life I thought was more tailor-made for a biopic than New Jack. Now, while you could argue Mick Foley or Nick Gage to have their stories put to the big screen, for my money, I want to see what could be done with the story of Jerome New Jack Young. For anyone unfamiliar with the most gangsta of all the gangstas, let me explain it like this. He was sort of like if Prime Mike Tyson and Prime Suge Knight had a baby, and then that baby snorted a shitload of cocaine and started attacking people like a rabid Rottweiler. In an industry where sometimes legitimacy is primarily driven by the suspension of disbelief, Jack was rocket fuel in that everybody believed what they were seeing with him was real. One of the most controversial figures in wrestling history, you would have absolutely no shortage of things to talk about when it came to this one. You could spend a bit outlining Jack's very dark past to explain the monster it created inside him, such as seeing his father both stab and shoot his mother, separate incidents by the way, an exploration into his years as a bounty hunter with apparently a number of justifiable homicides in the line of duty on his record, you could show his entry into the business and his time with Smoky Mountain Wrestling and the blatant racism he and his partners endured working in early 90s Tennessee during a post-Rodney King incident OJ Simpson trial America. His journey to ECW and all the years there are prime for a montage to advance some time and get us to the mass transit incident. Hell, he could even make an appearance in the aforementioned XBW movie since his feud with Vic Grimes and the infamous Scaffold match is one of the most notable things in that promotion's history, and then spin off into this. 
and we're not even including multiple other in-match assaults and subsequent legal battles that ensued. I mean, Jesus, are you not sports entertained at the prospect of this? Also, if A24 are going to be the ones that dip back into the wrestling world for more inspiration, I personally think that this would be the best choice for them, seeing as they cut their teeth in horror, and I think this could be done in the same aesthetic because Jack was legitimately crazy and scared the people around him. And as far as blurring the lines between cooperative confrontation and violent assault under the guise of willing participation, well, there is simply no one that out and out crossed at the number of times or to the severity that New Jack did. You could totally have that sinister undertone in this movie of a man who legitimately craved causing violence and his drug use and bloodthirst took him to places that people are still talking about to this very day. The only thing that is paramount to a creation like this is that the right person be cast in the lead role, someone who can walk that fine line of charisma and menace, but if they find that guy, this has so much potential. This will be the end of the new Jack movie. I'm sitting in a wheelchair, snorting coke. <laughs> I'm just sitting there snorting coke, just getting high as a and it'd be like the end, I'd be like, thank you bitches. Number six is gonna tell a love story set in the world of professional wrestling, and while I could understand wanting to go with Randy Savage and Elizabeth, I feel like it would be more of just a vehicle to make a movie about Macho Man because he's objectively the most intense and entertaining character that has ever existed. And listen, if you wanna make that movie and get like Dan Soder to play a Randy, I'll watch it. I'll watch sequels, hell, I'll watch a whole extended Macho universe where we explore him leaving our earthly plane and traveling from solar system to solar system, defending the intergalactic heavyweight championship. I will watch it. Everyone knows Hulk Hogan never really liked the black people. Uh -huh. <laughs> Trying to run a little basketball game with him, yeah. I'd be like, hey Hulk, let's do shirts for skins, yeah. He'd say not against them, yeah. That's not skins, the wrong skin, yeah. Read <laughs> it. However, I personally think the story of Chris Candido and his longtime sweetheart, Tammy Sitch, makes for a more heartbreaking tale of lovers being torn apart by the business that they loved. While I believe the rigors of what the wrestling business can do to a regular marriage is what ended the family savage, I think the seediness of the wrestling business itself is what ultimately played the primary role in Chris and Tammy's dissolution. Following the high school sweethearts rise together in the business and the drugs and infidelity that followed leading to their breakup is but one of the chapters in this tragedy though as further examination can be done into what a truly talented but unlucky performer Chris Candido was and despite looking like dollar signs early ended up never getting to fully live up to that potential. And then there's Tammy and how the dynamic between them changed when her star began taking off much further than his and how she became the first real pinup girl of WWE. There is the friendship and love that they did maintain during both of their falls, which ultimately culminated in Chris's early death. And then after all that, we have to deal with Tammy's slide into what she has become post Chris's death and her legal woes that she will be dealing with for a very long time. I just feel like there is more to be told with this one, and it's the one I want to see made. At number five, we have my own personal vanity request, and that is a telling of the life of the incomparable Rowdy Roddy Piper. Like many wrestlers, Hot Rod had a very tough upbringing, but few like him can claim to have actually lived literally on the streets and discovered wrestling as a means to be able to afford room and board at a youth hostel. I was living in a youth hostel. I wasn't doing too well in school. And my, my amateur goes to his father O'Malley, you know, he says, you know, Roderick, he says, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to go out some night. You're going to be cold. You're going to rob a 7-Eleven. They're going to catch you. They're going to put you in jail. They're going to rape you. Then they're going to kill you. <laughs> Do you know this for sure? <laughs> Tell you what I got. He says, have you ever seen professional wrestling? I said, no, sir. He says, I can get you $25. Roddy's path through the world of pro wrestling would be nothing short of comedic golden moments. From his debut and getting his nose broken and defeated in lightning speed, to being shown the ropes by Judo Jean LaBelle, to his crafting of the most acerbic and quick-witted character maybe ever, which led to fans both despising and then later adoring him. His real-life heat with Mr. T would be fun to relive in this format, as would the famous Piper's Pit segments, such as hitting Jimmy Snuka with a coconut, 
Hot Rod's movie career could be explored, being one of the first somewhat full-time exports from the wrestling world over to Hollywood, and you could definitely do some nice callbacks to his notable scenes like in They Live. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. And then there is his speaking out against the wrestling promoters of his time for the way that the business chews up and spits out its heroes, leaving many of the ones from the golden era with nothing but drug addictions and broken bodies. And I think the contrast of the many humorous moments, along with the sad end that Roddy ultimately ended up enduring, would be very interesting to see put on the big screen. Just give it to me, I don't want to have to explain it anymore. We're going to see how much Rod can they handle! Number four is going to be hard to put to film, and it certainly won't be for everyone, but I think few stories in the wrestling business can elicit the type of response that it would, and that is the story of the Smith family. Grizzly Smith is truly one of the most evil men that the business has ever seen for multiple reasons, and for the sake of not getting this video hit by the signature DDT of demonetization by YouTube, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch the Dark Side of the Ring episode to find out more. Even beyond that disgusting, unimaginable filth, Grizz was still a grade-A piece of shit for the ways he treated his children, three of the four of whom went on to become pro wrestlers in their own right, with the most famous being Jake the Snake Roberts. Jake's train wreck to redemption tale in and of itself would be compelling television, and then when you add in the factor of his sister Robin being privy to some of the evil things her father was engaging in and doing what she could do to try to stop it. I'm not going to go any further into their story, but like I said, look into it if you want to know more, and let's just say that this would make for one of the more visceral experiences that could be done with this medium. Oh! Ew! Dude! What the fuck? It would be an icky movie, sort of what I picture to be in the same vein of like the Nicolas Cage movie 8mm, but it would be an important movie to have exist. And speaking of Cage, let's just go ahead and cast him as Grizzly Smith. Watch your fucking mouth! Number three is an obvious slam dunk and the entry that is most realistically likely to happen in my opinion, and that is Nature Boy Ric Flair. You turn the camera off and I'll be naked when you come back! In fact, the Iron Claws director Sean Durkin has stated that if he comes back to do another wrestling biopic ever again, that it will be Flair he is most interested in doing. However, he's also said he would recast Aaron Dean Eisenberg to play him, and after his performance in the Iron Claw, well... No. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. 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 Hell no. 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 I refuse. No. No. Beginning with the mysterious circumstances surrounding the birth of one Fred Phillips as part of the Tennessee Children's Home Society's kidnapping scandal and his adoption to the Fleer family, who would give him the name we all know him by today, the man commonly known as the GOAT has the life and character that biopics were meant to tell. Nate is one of the few recognizable wrestlers to nearly everyone on the planet, whether they're a fan or not, and so while this would have universal appeal, there would also be so many opportunities for inclusions that the hardcores would be able to understand would be just for them. I mentioned his book in my review of The Iron Claw, but there are just so many hilarious and gripping stories from it that would translate to amazing scenes and have people glued to what they're watching. For example, just go Google the Jack Benigno story if you're not familiar with it. My only fear is that like the Von Erichs, Ric Flair might just be too big for one movie's runtime, and so I think we would need a trilogy of films honestly to be able to come close to what would be needed. Ric's career in particular also raises the opportunity to break some interesting ground on topics such as the true cost of sacrificing the things that most people would deem as what is important in life in order to attain greatness only seen by a select few, ensuring that your name will live on in immortality. There's also the conversation about a wrestler not knowing when or being able to give up chasing the high that only performing in front of thousands of screaming, adoring fans can give. It's been said that when it comes to the list of men who were at one point the classic traveling NWA World Heavyweight Champion, every single one of them eventually got to a point that after being broken down by the schedule, pressure, and lifestyle of being the man, that they all voluntarily asked to relinquish the belt to a successor every single one that is except for Ric Flair. There was point blank no one ever in the history of wrestling who exemplified that role and relished in it more than the Nature Boy. So when it came time to say goodbye to it all, well there's a lot to be said there let's just say. 
specific events such as the plane crash and the subsequent recovery, the creation and dominance of the Four Horsemen, the lawsuits and his battles with one-time boss Eric Bischoff, and his personal relationships with his ex-wives and children, including losing one son to drug overdose and having two other children go into the business as well to very different results. Slick Rick just has one of those stories that people will want to sit down and hear about, and I think we're likely someday going to get to have just that. Our top two entries might as well be tied because I think either one would be a massive smash hit, but I also think, each for different reasons, that they both present big challenges that may prevent us from ever getting them. So they could essentially swap spots, but it will make sense soon as to why I ultimately decided to go the way I did. Anyway, number two is going to be the larger than life tale of Andre the Giant. We have had some amazing documentaries previously about the eighth wonder of the world, such as the HBO one from some years back that have opened our eyes to Andre Rusimov the man, but I think seeing a full-fledged big screen film where we get to see his perspective on being a true anomaly would be very powerful viewing. The Giant dealt with, plot twist, gigantism, a rare condition where the pituitary gland produces too much growth hormone during a child's adolescent years, leading to a massive increase in height and weight far beyond the norm. For instance, as a young 12-year-old Frenchman, Andre already stood 6 foot 3 inches tall, eventually topping out at just over 7 feet. This made him a must-see attraction when he entered the world of professional wrestling, selling out building after building everywhere he went. And seeing his rise to fame would be great juxtaposed with the incessant teasing, staring, and harassment he constantly dealt with as a result of his massive size. Stories are a plenty of people fucking with Andre while he was in a bar on one of his classic 100 plus beer pounding sprees, and then finding out why you don't fuck with the giant as well as he was known to flip a vehicle with his harasser still inside. Side note, you could also insert scenes of the legendarily tough Haku in there as he and Andre were stable mates and tag team partners for a while. Again, Google Haku if you aren't sure what I'm talking about, but if you know, you know. Apparently he also has a short fuse. Look at that monster. Seeing Andre also deal with the stresses of being a giant in a normal sized world would be a must as well, as he had a more difficult time doing pretty much everything that us normal sized people take for granted. For instance, where do you think a giant takes a dump? Go check out Jake the Snake discussing that on Rogan if you're curious. Then you get to the point in his life dealing with the growing pain of his condition, and when he was convinced to turn heel in the late 80s and what that did to his psyche, which leads to getting to put the infamous WrestleMania 3 body slam moment into more perspective as well. Also, just going based off the stories in his wonderful biography, Larger Than Life, there is a lot to dive into, and what would be wonderful is if you could get his only child, Robin, to play a role in the creation as well. The only problem with this one, who in the hell are you going to cast to play Andre the Giant that has the size, that unmistakable voice and accent, athletic ability, oh, and also he's a halfway decent actor? It's going to be tough, but massive Andre-sized fingers crossed that we can somehow get this someday. And coming in at numero uno, it's got to be Vince McMahon. Told you it would make sense. Come on out, you rapist! For those of you who have been living under a Dwayne Johnson sized rock, let's just say Vince has been in the news recently. Go look it up if you somehow haven't heard about it. Ha <laughs> ha, that's such good shit. Now for a long while there was a biopic in the works on the genetic jackhammer called Pandemonium, a project that actually had the support of the WWE and its longtime owner, and was even rumored to have Bradley Cooper tabbed to play Vince at one point. However, back in March of last year, we got word from the movie's co-producers John Requa and Glenn Ficarra that the project was dead and reportedly that it was the big man himself that had killed it. We have never in our career had the studio, had an actor, everybody was just like, let's make this movie, and Vince just decided, we're not making it. So yeah, we're on a very long list of people that got fucked over by Vince. <laughs> Fellas, you had no idea. To be perfectly honest, to properly tell this story of the absolute silly, controversial, genius, perverted psychopath would likely take multiple seasons of a TV series to do it justice and to include everything that needs to be included. I mean, the sheer scope of it all is truly a mind-numbing prospect. His early years living with his mother and stepdad, whom he hated with a passion, his relationship with his real dad and his dad's business, and his journey to acquiring it and all of the baggage to unpack with that, 
his methodical takeover of the wrestling business and murder of the territory system, and all of the little gems of stories that lie within that narrative, like Black Saturday attacking NWA champion Harley Race in a restaurant bathroom when he refused to sign and screw over Vince's competition, ultimately signing Hulk Hogan, which then takes us to Hulkamania years and gambling on WrestleMania and all of the boom period, the many scandals from the Ring Boy scandal to the steroid trials to the many, many cases of sexual harassment allegations to the many, many unfortunate deaths inside of his orbit, his failed other ventures, the emergence of the Mr. McMahon character as the Monday Night Wars went hot, ultimately emerging victorious, the Montreal screw job, and just the aforementioned long list of people Vince has fucked over in general. And that doesn't even include the fucking bonkers last 10 years or so. I know Netflix is doing their docuseries on him still, which good luck to them in walking that tightrope now that them and the WWE are officially business fucking, and I know it's likely going to be great, but I think that there is just an absolute gold mine of a story that needs to be told when this is all said and done, and it will remain as the white whale of the wrestling biopic world until hopefully one day, God willing, we get it. But realistically, knowing the evil bastard we're dealing with, our chances of it happening are... How shall I put this? No and there you have it, friends. What did you think? If you have ideas for what you'd like to see get made, tell us all about it in the comments below. Also, if you haven't yet, do the things to the buttons. It helps tremendously, and then you won't miss out on the next episode on Spartacus, which I am finally going to do. Also, check out the Patreon if you'd like to help the channel grow, where for the low, low price of $2, I will immortalize you in the credits of my video as an executive producer. Love it. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. <laughs>